So good evening, uh, everybody, and welcome to our latest webinar. Uh, the uh, title tonight is Astrological Forecasting of Epidemic Disease in Early Modern England. And to talk to us on this topic, we have Dr. Michelle Pfeffer, uh, a fellow by examination at Maudlin. Uh, Michelle is a historian of early modern Europe. Before joining Maudlin last year, she was finishing her PhD in history in Australia at the University of Queensland. She has a master's in the history of science from Oxford, and she's been funded by the Royal Society of London to study their history of science collections. She works on the historical intersection of science and religion and is interested in how people in the past understood themselves and the world around them. She's writing a book about the experiences of people who in the 17th century risked their careers and reputations by denying traditional church doctrines about the soul and the afterlife. She's also working on a second book that hopes to explain why astrology, once a vibrant aspect of European cultural and intellectual life, uh, came to be rejected as a superstition outside the bounds of science, a huge shift that remains a major puzzle in the history of science. She spends most of her work days, she says, digging through the archives and reading old books, including many of those that we have in the old library here at Maudlin. So it's a real pleasure uh, for me to introduce Michelle to you this evening. Uh, Michelle's going to speak probably for about 35 minutes. And at the end of that, uh, we will be very happy to uh, take questions. Um, if you've got any questions for Michelle, uh, please type them into the Q&A box, which you can see uh, on your screens. You can type them in at any time, and Michelle and I will discuss your questions at the end of her talk. Uh, we expect to be finished at around seven o'clock. And just so everybody knows, we are recording this, um, so I hope that's okay. And without further ado, I'd like to hand over now to Michelle. Thank you very, very much. Thank you so much for that, Donna. I'm just going to share my screen. All right. Hopefully everybody can see that. Well, hello from Maudlin to everyone who's been able to tune in to the webinar this evening. So as Dinah said, my name's Michelle. And tonight I'm going to be sharing with you what I think is a rather surprising story about the history of science and about the history of medicine. So as my title suggests, I'm essentially going to be talking about I suppose the prehistory of some of the things that since the beginning of the pandemic have become pretty second nature to us. So in the last year and a half or so, we've all learned what the word epidemiology means, but we've also become accustomed to tracking case numbers and mortality figures, and also to thinking about health as an issue, not just of us as individuals, but actually as a shared issue of our cities, of our countries, and even of our planet as a whole. And these practices, these ways of thinking, none of them are new. They all have really long histories. And like many other historians, the pandemics really encouraged me to think more about people in how people in the past experienced um, similar circumstances to what we are experiencing today. Because of course, there are actually quite a lot of similarities to our current experience and what happened during, for example, outbreaks of bubonic plague in the medieval and early modern period. So for example, quarantine has been around for a really long time and was a standard practice throughout the medieval period. And then if we move forward to the Renaissance and the early modern period, people start also to be really interested in tracking mortality figures much as we do today. But of course, there's also a lot of differences between today and the past. And I'm gonna talk about one of these tonight. And this difference has to do with the question of expertise and who we turn to for reliable advice during epidemics and pandemics. Today, of course, most of us would turn to epidemiologists and to other public health experts. But in the past, people tended to turn to astrology. And this is a story that I'd like to share with you all tonight. So the history of how astrologers have attempted to predict, but also to monitor and even to control epidemic disease. And I'm going to be talking mainly about early modern England and mostly about the 17th century. So I want to start my talk by sharing the tale of a man called Richard Edlin, who was, I would say, 
a fairly normal astrologer living in 17th century London. Now these pictures aren't actually of Edlin himself. Sadly, we don't actually have any images of him, but we can imagine that he probably did look something like this. So like other astrologers at the time, Edlin ran an astrology clinic that was open from nine to five and saw clients who wanted advice about their health, but also their relationships, their jobs, and even their travel plans. And his clinic might have looked a little bit like the image on the left here. And when Edlin wasn't in his clinic, he was likely cooped up in his study, much like the man on the right, reading astronomical books and astrological books and playing around with scientific instruments. And one day while Edlin was reading his astronomical books, he came across a discovery that ended up changing his career. So we're in the year 1662, so a few years after the restoration of King Charles II, and we can imagine Edlin sitting in his study in the middle of busy London, reading a new book um, full of astronomical tables. So what that means is basically tables that astronomers had prepared, um, which outlined um, the positions of the stars um, as they were going to fall in the next couple of years. And this provided Edlin as an astrologer with the data that he needed to make his predictions. And as Edlin is reading through this book, he actually came across an upcoming astronomical event that started to really concern him. And this event was a great conjunction of the planets Saturn and Jupiter. So what, what does that mean? What is, it, what is a great conjunction? Well, essentially in this particular case, even though the planets Saturn and Jupiter are of course in reality millions of miles away from each other, during a conjunction from Edlin's perspective on Earth, they would actually appear to approach each other. And Edlin knew from his astrological training that conjunctions tended to herald really momentous events on Earth. So like a good astrologer, he decided that what he should do was try and find out what the impacts of this particular conjunction might be. And his first step was to use his astronomical tables to draw up a horoscope. And this is a picture of his horoscope here. And so Edlin began to sort of study his horoscope, searching for answers about the conjunction. And the first thing that he noticed was that Saturn and Jupiter were supposed to meet in um, the sign of Sagittarius, which was quite importantly part of the fiery triplicity, which was thought to be the most, the most important of the four different groupings of the 12 zodiac signs. And we can see this here in this yellow box here. So we have Saturn and Jupiter, and then Sagittarius there on the far left. The next thing that Edlin noticed was that according to the different positions of the planets and the zodiac signs on the horoscope, Saturn, a famously malign, malicious planet, unfortunately would have a lot more power and therefore influence in this particular conjunction rather than Jupiter, which was a famously benign planet. So things are not looking good. And this really disturbed Edlin, especially when he recalled theories that he'd been taught about Saturn's apparent tendency when in Sagittarius to incite outbreaks of epidemic disease. So Edlin basically starts to realize, okay, something really terrible is afoot. And so he sees it as his duty to publish a warning. And we can see that pictured here on the screen here. And in this book, he, he gravely announced to Londoners that this conjunction regrettably meant that they all had great cause to fear an approaching plague, and that a very great one, before the year 1665 be expired. So he publishes this in 1664. Soon after he published this book, Londoners saw two comets fly over the top of the city, uh, in, in that December. And these came to be seen as further indication of incoming pestilence. And people started to get really concerned. Other astrologers thought, hey, I'm gonna endorse Edlin's prediction. And newspapers like the one on the bottom right started to print really regular reports about what was going on. Now, for those of you who know your early modern history, you might remember that in 1665, London actually did experience a plague. And in fact, such a terrible plague that it was called the Great Plague of London. And Edlin was, of course, thrilled that he'd correctly predicted this particular epidemic. And as, as a result, he became really famous amongst astrologers. 
But his prediction and Edlin himself was soon forgotten. And that's partly because in the decades after he published it, astrology was starting to lose its previous credibility and cultural legitimacy. And that's something that I'm going to talk about in a, in a little bit. So by the time Daniel Defoe wrote his really famous Journal of the Plague Year, which was an account of the 1665 plague that he wrote in 1722, Edlin's prediction was all but forgotten. And instead, Defoe just complained about astrologers. So he said, astrologers who predict plague uh, do no more than, uh, than make the people really afraid. And they just produce universal melancholy amongst everyone, he says. And he complains that astrologers are basically doing no more than profiting off the naivety of the masses who were just simply addicted to astrology. Well, for the rest of my talk today, I'd like to talk about the broader history of these sorts of plague prognostications, but from a different perspective to Defoe's. And that's the perspective of the astrologers themselves. So compared to Defoe's rather cynical interpretation, the astrologers stressed that the aim of their predictions was really quite simple and even authentic. They simply wanted to, uh, to provide a warning of incoming pestilence so that the people could prepare for it. And we'll also see that these sorts of astrological plague predictions were really highly valued by most people in society. And this is actually because for most of the early modern period, these were the only, this was really the only public health advice that was available to the majority of the population. Okay, so before we get into it, I thought it was worth kind of briefly clarifying exactly what we mean by astrology and how that differs to astronomy. When we think of astronomy today, we might think of NASA, of telescopes, maybe also now of Elon Musk. And when we think of astrology, we might picture something like um, the really simplistic horoscopes that you can find in, say, magazines in the hairdresser. Of course, today, astrology is really different and extremely separate from astronomy. But for most of their history, they were actually considered to be two parts of the same science. So essentially, astronomy provided the data, so the positions of the heavens, that astrologers used to make their predictions. And in fact, for hundreds of years, astrologers and astronomers were usually one and the same person. And to just give you a brief example of this, on the, on the screen here on the bottom right, we have three images of three really famous and important astronomers from the early modern period. So Johannes Kepler, Galileo Galilei, and on the end, Tycho Brahe. Now, these three men made really significant um, discoveries about the makeup of our solar system and how it worked, but it's often forgotten that they also practiced astrology. And in fact, until around the 18th century, astrology was so closely tied to science and also to medicine that it was actually a compulsory subject in many universities. So if, uh, if you went to university um, up until around the 17th century, if you were at Magdalen up until around the 17th century, no matter what you were there to study, you would have taken some astrology. And in fact, it was the primary purpose of the professor of mathematics to actually teach their students astrology, as well as to provide the mayor of the city with astrological predictions every single year. And I think it's quite funny to imagine the mathematics uh, tutors here at Magdalen today, not only having to teach their students about horoscopes, but also having to walk down to the Lord Mayor's office and to deliver predictions for the coming year. This is, of course, a very different type of uh, academic consulting to what we're used to today. So on the screen here, I've got some images of some of the instruments that would have been familiar to students of astronomy. So on the far left, here we have an armillary sphere and then to the right of it, an astrolabe. And these two particular objects are actually housed at the moment in the History of Science Museum here at Oxford, which if you haven't been yet, I would highly recommend. So these three instruments were really useful both for astronomers and for astrologers because they enabled the user to, uh, to locate the positions of the planets as they landed on the, um, the, the, the stars that made up the signs of the zodiac really quite accurately for any point in the year. And of course, they're really beautiful to boot. And speaking of beautiful instruments, on the bottom left here is a lovely rotating volvel, which is actually from a book that we have in Magdalen at the old library. 
And this is such a stunning, stunning book, and I have some more pictures of it on the next page. And this particular instrument essentially served the same purpose as the two above it. So it helped, it helped astronomers to locate the, the um, particular planets as they fell in various parts of the heavens. And this was primarily used for astrological predictions. Okay, so let's look at some bigger pictures of this. So these lovely images, which I just, I just really love, are from a book called the Astronomicum Caesarian, um, published in 1540. Um, uh, under the authorship of a man called Petrus Appianus. And it's got a reputation as being, as you can probably imagine, one of the most beautiful scientific books ever produced. Uh, the, these sorts of colours were just so rare and expensive in the early modern period as well. So you can see that so much money has gone into producing this scientific book. And you can also hopefully see that, especially in the bigger image on the right, the Volvel is essentially aimed to look like a paper version of an astrolabe, which is pictured on the right here. And as I said before, it's basically, I mean, it's essentially a paper computer that helps people to locate with really surprising accuracy um, where specific um, celestial bodies land in the heavens at particular times. So basically what I'm trying to say is that astrology was part and parcel of the standard scientific way of understanding the universe in pre-modern Europe. And that's, of course, a very different way of understanding how the world works compared to what we're used to today. And we can see that in a little more detail on the next slide. So here are some images of how um, the cosmos was thought to be arranged. So as you can see, Earth is in the middle and a round Earth, by the way, not a flat Earth, um, is in the middle. And it's surrounded by essentially um, concentric circles that overlap each other, much like an onion, really, and they're thought to rotate around the Earth. So after the Earth, the first sphere is the Moon, and then we go through um, the planets as they appear in the solar system. And of course, the Sun is considered one of these planets. At the very outer circle, we have the stars that make up the constellations of the zodiac, which you can see more clearly, I think, in, in the, the image of the left. And, and um, you hopefully can kind of get a sense of how this actually worked in astrological theory with this little clip here that was made by the History of Science Museum. So with the Earth in the center and then first the moon orbiting around it, you can see that from the Earth's perspective, the moon is going to be falling in one of the signs of the zodiac as it orbits, as it orbits us. Now, outside the zodiac sphere was God and his angels. And you can also kind of get a sense of this from some of these images as well. And the idea was that whatever happened in the outermost layers of this kind of onion impacted what happened at the center. So God was thought to use the signs of the zodiac as well as each of the planets to basically govern life on Earth. And some of these celestial influences were thought to be more obvious than others. So, for example, the moon's influence on the tides or the fact that the sun gives us, you know, heat and light. But for pre-modern people, the stars were thought to influence almost every aspect of life. So natural things like the weather and reproduction, but also very human things like personalities and relationships. Now, much of this way of thinking came from a man called Claudius Ptolemy, who lived in the second century AD in Egypt and wrote a bunch of books that actually remained standard textbooks in their fields for over a thousand years. And it's mainly from Ptolemy that astrologers got the idea that they could also use the tools of their trade to predict epidemics. And this came from the idea that astrology was a really useful tool in medicine. So as Ptolemy said, the planets are essentially the distant cause of disease. And for this reason, one could use astrology to provide diagnoses, prognoses, and even appropriate treatments for disease. But Ptolemy also went further than this. And so he suggested that astrologers were authorities not only on the health of their own individual patients, but also on the health of their communities, or as he puts it, on whole races, countries, and cities. And this more general type of astrology that he outlined was thought to enable predictions about events that were going to influence a huge, um, a huge number of people. So things like bad weather or huge significant political changes, wars, but also epidemics. Now, these theories were hugely influential. And if we jump forward to the early modern period, so, you know, over a thousand years, 
we can see that people were still taking them really, really seriously. And astrologers could make really good livings making predictions about health and disease. And astrologers' businesses really boomed after the printing revolution when uh, astro astrological writings uh, really spread at unprecedented rates amongst the literate population. So the most effective way that early modern astrologers disseminated their predictions was through small and really popular books called almanacs, which usually looked a little something like this, although admittedly this is a rather pretty almanac. So almanacs, almanacs are essentially cheap books um, that um, were published in new editions every year and included a whole lot of useful information. So one of the first things they included was simply just a calendar and in fact an astronomical calendar which also provided useful information about um, the sun and the moon in particular. And you can also see in this particular image we also have some astrological observations on the right for in this case um, uh, the month of September in, in a year in the 17th century. But also, much like a modern pocket diary, they included a lot of reference materials. So things like tables of weights and measures, uh, distances between towns, holidays, so feast days, and also things like upcoming eclipses, like in this example, which is from actually Maudlin's old library, and also from the, this image at the back, um, times of sunrise and sunset throughout the, throughout the year. Now, another thing that Almanacs did was to try and improve the health literacy of their readers. And they did this by distributing in their pages theoretical material and also practical directions about health and disease. So, for example, Almanacs provided uh, what they thought to be propitious times, so good times, to perform various therapeutic procedures such as bloodletting or purging and even as you can see on this image a good time to sweat in a hot house and also a good time to cut the head of the, the hair of the head or of the beard so really really practical tips and they also included more general advice about good diet and exercise and also herbal remedies that one could make at home and um, almost all almanacs included an image of the zodiac man um, a couple of examples of which are pictured here and i just i just love these images Basically, their purpose is to show that different parts of the body were thought to be governed by different zodiac signs. And this was really important because it was believed that surgery should not be performed on a part of the body when the moon happened to be in the sign that was ruling that particular part. And this was thought to be so, so important that actually in the Renaissance in a couple of different countries in Europe, it was actually illegal to perform surgery on somebody if you hadn't first checked your almanac. So, uh, so almanacs were printed in many different editions each year and each edition had its own target audience to whom they usually tailored their health advice. So for example, almanacs written by women and for women such as the women's almanac here and also on the left, the ladies diary, which is um, one of the almanacs in our collection here in the old library. They provided guidance um, for health issues that were peculiar to women. So things like menstrual ab abnormalities or issues with pregnancy, but also things like cosmetic rem remedies. And some of them, particularly the one in the left that we have at Maudlin, also included mathematics lessons for ladies. And this was really important in a period, of course, when women couldn't attend university. Okay, so beyond this basic medical guidance, Almanacs also included a general prognostication of the year for the year, which also provided a report on the state of the local community's health and the risk of epidemics. And this report was based on an astrological procedure called the horoscope for the revolution of the year. So horoscopes are essentially maps of the heavens as seen from a particular place on earth in a particular time. And this type of horoscope mapped the heavens at the sun's annual entrance into the sign of Aries in March. And this essentially marked the beginning of the astrological year. And we can see this um, sort of outlined in the little box in the center of this horoscope on the left. So we can see it says the sun enters Aries as a sign of Aries. Um, and in 1655, this happened um, on March the 10th and it gives you the time. And it says that this was calculated for London. So drawing on theories that 
uh, essentially outlined all the complex ways that the heavens could impact life on Earth, astrologers use these horoscopes to uh, make annual forecasts about the likelihood of anything from gout to leprosy, uh, tumours, smallpox, and even things like headaches and madness. So this particular horoscope that's on the screen at the moment um, was compiled by an astrologer called William Andrews. And Andrews claimed that the horoscope for the year 1655 suggested that that year, unfortunately, London would experience famine, earthquakes, and even a steep rise in highway crime. And things were looking even worse for the city's health. So he explains that mischievous Mars, the mischievous planet Mars, was going to be in the fifth house of the horoscope. I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, but if you can, it's the triangle there on the bottom right. So that's the fifth house. We can see Mars there. And the fifth house, the fifth house was um, thought to govern children. And so Andrews explains that, well, this means we're probably going to see a rise in cases of measles and smallpox among children, but also many more cases than usual of miscarriage. Other astrological conditions that year, he said, meant that Londoners should also expect violent pestilential diseases, such as plague, but also smallpox and burning fevers. And the astrologer suggested that his readers should pray to God and, you know, ask for mercy in the hope that he would avert these disasters. Another example is from a horoscope, uh, sorry, an almanac for the year 1675. And this year, the horoscope was said to show that Jupiter and Mars would bring about many quarrels as well as, you know, robberies and also thunderstorms and snowstorms, but also much ill health. So the astrologer explained that Jupiter ruled the lungs and the liver and Mars the gallbladder. And this meant that we should expect, you know, disease in these, these particular organs this year. And he also explained that because Mars was a hot and dry planet, we should be particularly wary of dried up lungs. Okay, so astrologers made forecasts like this that were said to apply across the board to all people resident in, in this case, London. But they also made additional, more nuanced predictions about the health of what we might call different subpopulations of society. So, for example, Nicholas Culpepper, who was a really famous astrologer and physician in the 17th century, in his almanac for 1652, of which you can see the horoscope there on the screen, he suggested that the positions of Saturn and Mars that year meant that just clergy and lawyers should expect epidemic disease that year. And he also said that the Volga would probably fall ill from ill diet. And because of the position of Venus, men would also be much given to lechery and we could expect a lot of cases of the pox as Culpepper put it, have a care, young men, lest you pay for your pleasure. Sweet meat has sometimes sour sauce. Similarly, William Andrews' Almanac for 1670 suggested that the position of Saturn in the horoscope for that year, and Saturn was a famously cold and dry planet, meant that melancholy, a cold and dry disease, would likely seize upon many people in the country. And he says particularly common people. And he also said that strange colds, coughs and consumptions would also be likely amongst people who lived in moist, moorish and finny places. So astrologers, in other words, also suggested different health outcomes for people based on their individual circumstances. After all, they believed that different parts of the heavens ruled not just different parts of the body, but also different types of people. Astrologers, of course, um, identified some subgroups of society that we really wouldn't value today. So, for example, Galenic temperament. But they also used more recognizable categories like age and even socioeconomic status. Okay, you might be thinking, did anyone actually read what astrologers were saying in their almanacs? Were these perhaps just the ramblings of eccentric outsiders who maybe were just ignored by the majority? Well, for me, the most exciting part about all this is that almanacs are actually best-selling texts in this period, and they came second in sales only to the Bible, and in fact, they often even beat the Bible in sales. So this means that as historical, his, historical sources, they're hugely valuable because they, they give us an idea of what the majority of the population were reading.
So these are um, just quickly some figures here of um, the, the sales of, or the printing rather, um, print runs of almanacs in the middle years of the 17th century in England. And I, I, I will just, all that I'll say about this is that these are numbers that are really quite astonishing for this period. And excitingly, there's also hundreds of copies of surviving annotated almanacs. And these are really useful pieces of evidence because they show us exactly how people were engaging with their almanacs, how they read them and what they decided to do after they read them. Because almanacs, after all, were pragmatic literature and alongside their predictions about disease, they also generally provided suggestions for ways you could mitigate impending health risks. It's probably unlikely that most readers actually followed this advice to the letter, but the evidence suggests that a good many of them took it really seriously. And this is also suggested by surviving letters that were written to astrologers in the 17th century. So for example, Nicholas Culpepper, who we met before, he received so many letters of thanks for his disease predictions that he ended up saying that he felt so encouraged by all this that he decided to continue, as he put it, to deliver my judgment for the public good, what diseases are likely to reign, and what may be applicable for them that shall be afflicted with them. Okay, so we're now at the last part of the webinar. And it's here that I wanna talk about something that I've spoke, I suppose I've rather, rather tentatively called astronomic, uh, astrological epidemiology. Okay, what I mean by this is that astrologers' interests in public health, which we've just seen, combined with their long-standing tendency to search for correlations between events on Earth and the positions of the heavens, actually made astrology the most obvious discipline in this period for the study of epidemics. Since the first outbreak, outbreak of plague in Europe, astrology had been central to understandings of the causes of the disease. So it was thought that plague could be caused by the stars, both by the stars directly corrupting the body but also by the stars corrupting the air, which was thought to then corrupt the body. And this, of course, this is one of my favorite anecdotes. This is how we get the word influenza. So respiratory illness was thought to be caused by the influence of the stars. And we can see this depicted here, I think really nicely in these images of, on the screen here. Now these series were also supported by what we could call the research projects of astrologers. So we saw at the beginning that Edlin based his prediction of the 1665 plague on a great conjunction. And his idea that great conjunctions could actually cause plague was partly based on the research that he'd undertaken himself and the parallels he'd noticed between huge outbreaks of plague in London and previous conjunctions. And we can see here, this is him having a go at looking at a, a conjunction of 1603. Comparative studies like this are actually really common amongst astrologers. They were essentially trying to search for patterns that would shed new light on the causes of plague. And hopefully, at least they, they hoped, uh, make for more reliable disease predictions. And we're now gonna look quickly at the research project of one particular astrologer who went really above and beyond the rest of his peers by grounding his research, not only in astronomical data and astrological theories, but also in mortality records. So mortality records had been kept in London since at least the 16th century, and they were made publicly available as bills of mortality. And you can see some examples here on the screen. The bills tabulated weekly mortality data that was collected by so-called ancient women who were engaged by their parish to go out and visit the bodies of the newly deceased and to determine the cause of death. And as you can see on the screen, some of the causes of death that we can find in the bills of uh, mortality are quite strange to us today, to say the least. Probably my favorite one on that list there is found dead in the street as a cause of death. I'm also really intrigued by teeth and itch. But anyhow, the bills of mortality were actually really quite useful for people in London who could use them to decide uh, whether or not their parish seemed to be at risk of plague and whether it was actually time for them to escape to the country. But until the mid 17th century, the bills weren't really subject to much analysis or research. And one of the first people to actually study the bills really closely in this way was an astrologer. And his name was John Gadbury. Uh, 
This is a, a lovely colorful picture of him in the middle of the screen. So Gadbury was a really famous astrologer in the 17th century. He was a really important figure in the Society of Astrologers, which was a research group that actually predated the Royal Society of London. And Gadbury lived through several outbreaks of plague in London. And I think much like a lot of scientists today, this really encouraged him living through a plague, encouraged him to try to use his expertise to come up with solutions. So it was in the midst of the 1665 plague, the one that Edlin had predicted, that Gadbury realised that the bills actually contained a lot of really useful information that could potentially be used to both test and also to improve astrological plague predictions. And he ended up publishing his findings in the book on the right called London's Deliverance Predicted. Now, Gadbury's research question was, as he put it, what is the probable time that the present pest may abate? Gadbury thought that 17th century medical doctors simply uh, were unable to explain when epidemics would arrive, how long they would last, and how many lives they'd take. And he was pretty right about this. And Gadbury unsurprisingly thought that astrologers were actually uniquely placed to provide answers to these pressing questions. So, so Gadbury's project was a study of correlations between the positions of the planets and rises and falls in plague deaths in a number of significant plagues in London, four in fact, as you can see here in his table. So Gadbury's next step after compiling, compiling this table was to compare its data with the respective positions of the heavens. And the astrological theory that he relied on for this was the idea that the aspects of the planets, that is the angles between them on a horoscope could either have good or bad effects. And you can see that outlined here. So for example, Gadbury's table suggested that in the plague of 1593, Deaths were quite low until June when they suddenly start to rise. And Gadbury said that he noticed that at this point, Saturn was in opposition, so a bad angle with other planets in the horoscope. He noticed that deaths then increased dramatically in July. And at this point, he says, Mars was square with the moon, so another bad angle. Later on, by the time we get to September that year, he says deaths start to steadily decrease. And from this point onwards, he said that Venus was trying with the moon, so a good angle. And Gabri claimed to find similar patterns like this for every other year on his table. Now, his final step was to apply his findings to the 1665 plague. And he came to the conclusion that for the rest of the year, the angles on the horoscope meant that August and September would sadly prove quite fatal. October might look a little bit better at the beginning of the month, but by the end of the month, it would be looking far worse. But finally, Gadbury said, by the time we get to November and December, things are going to be looking good. As he put it, it would prove quite kindly and we'd see steady declines in plague deaths. Now, when we look back at the mortality figures for the plague of 1665, we see that Gadbury's prediction that the plague would ease up towards the end of the year actually proved to be correct. But it should be said that when we look at the data for plague deaths um, throughout this entire period, this downfall in deaths at the end of the year was actually a really common pattern. It happened every single time. And early modern people knew this. Gadbury himself knew it. And it was something that actually, of course, probably had more to do with the weather than with the angles between planets on the horoscope. But all in all, even though Gabri was relying on theories that many of us would discredit today, his astrological study was one of the first to actually use mortality data to isolate what we would now call determinants of, the, of disease at the population level, and then to use this analysis to go on and make predictions about the course of an epidemic. And considering astrology's strong grounding at the time in both the medicine and the mathematics of the day, I think it's not all that surprising that it would be an astrologer who would make such a pioneering study. Okay, I'm just gonna finish up by picking out what I think are a few things, a few key takeaways from this story. The first is that in the early modern period, took, astrologers took on many of the activities we associate with public health today. 
So we've seen that astrologers worked to improve the general health literacy of the public. And they also disseminated annual disease forecasts. And some of them, like Gadbury, undertook research that even if it proved to be a dead end, still paved the way for quantitative studies of disease. And I think this is really interesting to think about because public health is usually assumed to be a uniquely modern phenomenon, something that had its roots in the 19th century at the very earliest. But I think the history we've looked at tonight suggests that this is not quite right. I think the case of astrologers shows that long before the 19th century, the experts of the day, in this case astrologers, regularly went beyond individual case studies to consider the broader health of the population, which is something that we tend to take for granted today. And this leads me to what I think is the second key takeaway, which is that while we might discredit the assumptions of early modern astrologers, they nevertheless, they nevertheless played an important role in the history of medicine, and they paved the way for naturalistic explanations of disease. So explanations that went beyond simply attributing plague, for example, to God's anger or the sins of the people. So to close, even if the public health activity undertaken by astrologers in this period was undeniably hamstringed by some of their most basic assumptions, I think that our modern standards should not justify sweeping aside or ignoring parts of our past that were highly valued by our ancestors. And I'll finish by just pointing again to these wonderful images on the screen from that book from the Magdalen Library. And I'll hand back to you, Dinah. Thanks so much for listening. Oh, you're muted, Dinah. But thank you so much, Michelle. That was absolutely fascinating. And uh, it's a real treat to see some of the books from the Magdalen Library uh, and to see them deployed so interestingly in the course of your argument. And we were discussing a couple of days ago that it would be fun to do another webinar, um, a little bit like the tour of Addison's that we did, a, a video tour of the Magdalen Old Library. And, and seeing what you've done with the books makes me think that would actually be a, a wonderful activity. Thank you. <laughs> Um, just a couple of, of things. Um, while, while you were doing that, I did a swift Google search, um, slightly in a state of alarm, and discovered that there was a great conjunction <laughs> between Jupiter and Saturn on the winter solstice of 2020. Mm -hmm. So th this seems to me like a really, really bad sign. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just hoping that hoping that we might have exhausted its malign influence by now. Um, <laughs> well, you know what, they happen They happen every 20 years or so, so. <laughs> yeah. so, so it's a bit, but particularly on the winter solstice, it seems particularly grim. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I was fascinated by is, is these, um, the, the, the cause of death bills mm. and the weekly toll of deaths. And one of the things that really yeah. struck me reading a journal of the plague year mm. is how Defoe uses those daily and weekly totals of deaths. And as they move across the parishes yeah. and people start off saying, oh, it's fine. It's only in the West End. We don't care. We're in the East. And gradually the plague starts to move towards them. And, mm -hmm. and we've all felt that yeah. uh, on multiple occasions over the last year as you, as you watch the case numbers yeah. uh, ticking up as they are yeah. now. Absolutely. And people changed their behavior by watching what was happening in the bills. They thought, you know, okay, that parish does not look so good. So mm -hmm. I'm going to, I'm not going to shop there anymore. And actually another way that they were used, the bills were used by, were by shop owners who thought, oh gosh, you know, we're going to actually have steep declines in our business because people are going to, mm -hmm. you know, stop coming to my parish. And so they were actually yeah. really important tools. Yeah. And we're seeing exactly the same behaviors now. Yeah. where people put their postcodes into the, all, the, all the maps of COVID and see where, where the hotspots are. It's exactly yeah. the same. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, we've had a lot of uh, really interesting questions. Um, one question is about whether um, pre-enlightenment magical beliefs have declined uh, since 1650. Have those beliefs gradually diminished? Have they fallen in a series of steps and have they sometimes crept up again? Mm. And are they creeping up again now? Yeah, gosh. Well, it's a huge question to start with. And I might start by spruiking actually an event that I'm running on September 3 at Oxford, which is open to all. It's going to be online. And it's actually about this exact question, the decline of magic. So there was a really famous book published by a really important historian here at Oxford called Keith Thomas. 
He's now 88. He's in really, really, really good health. And so we're going to get him together to sort of discuss what he says in the book and where research has gone since. Because I think in the past, historians tended to assume that you know, we have the scientific revolution and all of a sudden we're enlightened and we don't need magic. Maybe we don't even need religion anymore. And there's this big assumption that these beliefs just fall away. But actually what historians have found is that it's really actually not quite what happened. Not only did science not really ever really have a direct effect on magic, even on astrology, and maybe I can talk about that a little bit more in a bit, but the, peop the, the people who maybe didn't go to university, which is, of course, the majority of the population for, for, for hundreds of years still after this point, um, these beliefs are still really, really popular and really widespread. I mean, we can think about even today, there's still, you know, things that we could call witch hunts happening in many countries around the world. And of course, even astrology today is actually experiencing a massive upsurge um, amongst people who are around my age, actually. Mm -hmm. And people now can make millions and millions of pounds from um, making an app that people can use to get bespoke astrological guidance on their smartphones, right? So, and, and especially if we think about the population in general on this planet, in just increasing so in, at such a rate actually in real numbers probably more people today believe in these things than actually a couple of hundred years ago so it's a really interesting question and something that historians are actually still grappling with but these things of course are always really quite complex and they're never quite what they seem a related question from simon haslam who says uh, this is fascinating it's so surprising it took so long for educated people to realize that astro astrology wasn't working, what contributed to this lack of challenge by more educated people? Yeah, yeah, it's a really interesting question, actually. So essentially, astrology starts to be removed um, from university curricula in about the 17th century. And so this, I think we can take as a sign that the experts in astronomy and in related fields are starting to be a little bit concerned about whether or not astrology is actually a legitimate way of understanding nature. And it might seem on the surface that something that might have had a big kind of event that might have had something to do with this might be the Copernican revolution, right? So the images that I showed you of the structure of the universe, we have Earth at the center. But what happened in the Copernican revolution was, oh, okay, we start to realize actually, no, that's not how things are. The sun's in the center of the universe, okay? Uh, well, in the center of our solar system. So Earth kind of gets displaced. So no longer is Earth sort of the focal point, but Earth is actually just off to the side. And it seemed really obvious um, for a long time to many people that this is this clearly must have just been a death blow to astrology. But actually, when we look a little bit closer again, it's, it's just a little bit more complicated because astrologers actually were really unbothered by this. They just thought, oh, OK, yep, no worries. And in fact, astrologers were some of the first people. I mean, because Copernicus's ideas took a long time to be taken up. And it was actually astrologers who actually were some of the first to say, hey, this, this actually looks like really good science. We probably should actually start thinking about the world differently. So this, the, the story of the history of the decline of astrology is, is full of these kind of contradictions. Things like that definitely have an impact. But the Copernican Revolution, I mean, if you ask sort of the everyday man or woman on the street, they had in the 17th century, most of them probably don't really know this stuff yet. And so it takes a long time for these discoveries to kind of, I guess, I guess to filter down. And astrology is so, so flexible, you know. Astrology had dealt, uh, had dealt already with the discovery even back in the second century BC of the precision of the equinoxes, which is basically um, the actual fixed stars themselves seem to rotate from our, uh, the way that they rotate in the sky themselves. And astrologers were like, okay, no worries, we'll just recalculate things. And the discovery, of course, of new planets, Neptune, mm -hmm. for example, they just get fed into the pre-existing system, right? And so there's, there's ways of this, um, this kind of new discovery being just assimilated in. What does seem to have an impact, though, actually, is religion. So Christianity, of course, is, you know, still the state religion throughout Europe in um, the early modern period. And it was in this period that many sort of Christian leaders started to be like, hang on a second, is astrology actually a very Christian way of understanding the world or is it a pagan way? And actually, is it too deterministic for our idea of free will? On which, of course, um, doctrines about sin and doctrines about eternal damnation are so closely tied. So I would say my opinion is that religion actually potentially has more to do with it at the very beginning at least, than science. And it's only later that science actually comes to uh, attack astrology more closely. One of the things that struck me from some of the materials you were showing us was um, 
that when you look at some of the predictions mm. you know, that this year men will be lustful and will get yeah. the pox, mm-hmm. um, poor people will have a poor diet. Yeah. And people who live in marshy places will get coughs and colds. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it might not be terribly surprising. Yeah. If I know. some of those yeah. predictions come true. Yeah. I mean, um, it's, it's really interesting. And a lot of historians, because they've noticed exactly what you've noticed, they've really dismissed almanacs and gone, okay, well, clearly no one could actually treat this advice seriously because it seems to be repeated every single year. You know, they often would say things like, oh, you know, the elderly are going to die if they go out in, into the snow with no clothes on. You're like, okay, <laughs> yep, that's, a, that's a really useful prediction. And Women actually, will die that, in childbirth. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Men are going to go out and seek prostitutes, right? Like, it, it, this was just something that was rife at the time, right? Um, but at the same time, there were also, people, people knew this stuff at the same time. So there were actually satirical almanacs and these some of these are actually as popular as the real thing and so I found some really funny ones where they say things like oh you know in the winter time you know the most common uh, problem is going to be people are going to burn their knees from sitting too close to the fire and you know stuff like this and so people were quite aware that sometimes the health predictions were actually really quite trite um but of course it wasn't just the health predictions that people were buying their almanacs for it was also things that I haven't talked about, such as weather predictions and also agricultural predictions, right? So is there going to be a famine? What's the price of corn likely going to be? And also political, right? And so there's there's, there's sort of like an entertainment value as well as a pragmatic value to this. I mean, we also, we, we remember the prediction of the 1665 plague because he struck lucky. Yeah. But question on how many other years were plagues predicted that didn't happen? Yeah. Uh, by how many other astrologers? Yeah, and just and that, the yeah. one astrologer who happens to go for 1665 gets, oh my goodness, you know. Yeah, well, that's exactly right. And in, <laughs> in his book as well, he actually, this plague was only one of the many things that he predicted. He also pr- predicted great wars and all these other things, which, you know, which didn't happen. And of course, he was very keen in his later work to just say, oh, you know, like, look at this wonderful <laughs> prediction that I made. Um, but, you know, people actually weren't really bothered by the failures of astrologers for the most part. And this is partly because failure was actually really built into the DNA of astrology from its very beginning. So it was always thought to be, the technical term is a stochastic art. So it basically means that um, it's, it's, it's an educated guess, right? So the metaphors they always use are aiming, not hitting, okay? Mm-hmm. And, and astrologers are really quite adept at saying, you know, this is just a trend that I foresee and who knows what might happen, right? There are other causes that might interfere, other natural causes, God might interfere, And of course, human free will might actually change things as well. So astrologers are really good at blaming uh, things also on the complexity of the astrological theory. And they would say, look, I'm not trained enough. You know, Uh, it it was my fault. But the art itself is okay. Blame the artist, not the art, is what they would say. And the more more you tell us about astrology, I mean, we've had I've had a number of questions here that are on this theme, uh, that that it does really seem to be quite similar to economics, (laughs) other forms of of modeling, including the, the modeling of, of modern day epidemiologists. I mean, what you've just said about, oh, well, you know, the model's terribly complex and it depends on what your input factors are. And yeah, yeah. Um, it's not that different. And, and of course, economists get their predictions wrong all the time. And again, they just say, oh, well, you know, it's too, too, just too yeah. complex. That's right. And we still have, of course, economists in universities because we see them as being really valuable. But that's mm-hmm. something that actually a lot of people say that to me. They say, you know, they're just, you know, the early economists. <laughs> And actually they were, I mean, I'm, I'm setting up astrologers as being, you know, precursors to public health officials, but they were also precursors to economists and also to people who would, um, what's it called, election forecasting, right, and meteor- meteorology. Um, and so they kind of were actually sort of the original general practitioner in a way. Um, but yeah, absolutely, right? Prediction is difficult. Prediction is difficult. And there's ways of doing it well, and there's ways of um, using the right data, right? And that's something that we don't always see or if ever, right, with astrology. Question from Stephen Taylor. Uh, Is the astrological system automatic or was God thought to intervene in the zodiac? Mm, Okay, really good question. And there's there's a lot of debate about this actually amongst philosophers in the early modern period. So basically some people would say that God is constantly intervening in nature, right, not just through miracles, but also he's, you know, fiddling around with things and he's controlling all the little bits and pieces. But other people would have Earth functioning and the universe as as a clock, right? Something that essentially happens automatically is maybe wound up at the beginning and maybe God needs to come in every now and then and wind things up. 
Um, but for the most part, these are kind of seen as fairly automatic things, right? So God's not generally thought as um, playing with all the different strings, right? Because there's hundreds of thousands of possible ways that the planets could impact Earth. Um, but he's still definitely, there's, he's, it's still, God is still seen as the first cause, right? The prime mover of everything, even if it's not, you know, him consciously changing everything. A uh, question from Annalise Andrews. Uh, she says, this is very, really super interesting. Are there any connections between Western astrology and that of China and other Eastern regions? Yeah, such, such an interesting question. So the first thing I would say is that uh, people who study anthropologists, for example, um, at different cultures around the world, often do this kind of thing where they say, let's try and find top shared cultural ideas that all cultures in the world seem to have in common. And astrology is always in the top five or top 10 of that list, right? So Western astrology is the kind of thing that I've been describing today. So not every culture would have the exact same theories, but basically every single culture around the world has the idea that somehow these bodies in the sky are maybe intelligent or at least are connected to what happens on Earth. And of course, it, it, as I said before in the talk, you know, it's quite obvious to see the moon's influence on tides. Mm -hmm. And the moon also, you know, seems to potentially line up with things like menstruation, for example. And so it seems obvious for people um, that there must be a connection. In terms of actual cultural exchange, it's a really good question. So a lot of the theories that I've described today have their origins in, you know, ancient Babylon. And at the time, you know, uh, that we move forward, you know, to Greece and, and then uh, what's really important actually is the Ottoman Empire. So Islamic philosophers um, living throughout the Ottoman Empire take these theories that they've gained from Babylon and also from ancient Greece. And at the same time, they are interacting with people um, on the eastern side of the continent, right? And so there's constant interaction. So I'm not an expert on the period in which that's happening. That's a little bit before my time, but I know for sure that there is some exchange and that exchange goes back and forth as well, right? Um, but the idea of conjunctions actually is not really a Greek idea. That's actually an Islamic idea. Mm -hmm. So there's a huge, huge influence from things beyond what we would think of as, you know, Western philosophy here. Um, really interesting question, thanks. Uh, Harry Morgan um, points out that the table of yearly almanac printing yeah. uh, had a, reached its peak in 1665. Yeah. That was the, the mm -hmm. greatest popularity. Uh, did people turn to them particularly for advice in times of disaster? Yeah, really, really good question. So I think there's two sort of things going on there with those dates. The first has to do with, yeah, you're absolutely right. In times of disaster, we can actually really track people's interest in astrology based on not just the books that they were buying, but also um, some historians have studied really fascinating case study uh, case studies that were uh, basically the records of astrologers in their clinics. So there's a wonderful project at Cambridge called the Case Books Project, um, which has just incredible records from all these people from all walks of life coming to their astrologer, right? And so we can see also the numbers of people visiting astrologers that can give us an idea of interest in astrology. And this does seem to peak in England in the middle years of the 17th century. And I do think that that has something to do with plague, but it's also, of course, after a civil war, right? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of things going on politically. Um, the second thing I would say about particular around, you know, the middle years of the 1660s is we also have really charismatic astrologers who became basically huge public figures. So Gabri is one of them, but actually even more so is a man called William Lilly, who um, was really, his, his almanacs were so popular because he was making predictions about the king, he was making predictions about wars, and he was also including a lot of really salacious, salacious gossip, right? And so there's also this question of entertainment value of almanacs, and we can see that his almanacs were selling, you know, miles above all the others, and that's at the very point where, these, where, we, where we see that peak in the middle years of the 17th century. So there's something going on where we can just have a really charismatic leader, actually, of the field. And once he, so actually an interesting story, just quickly, actually with him, he actually correctly predicted the great fire of London in 1666. So that's another huge thing that happens. And another thing, right, where we have an astrologer predicting something correctly, but what happened this time was after the fire, people said, hang on a second, William Lilly predicted it. Do we think that he actually set the fire? 
how else would he be able to break <laughs> this? So there was this, you know, right? There was this, you know, legal investigation, right? And he had to escape to the country. And after he escaped to a country, he essentially had to retire. And that actually comes, we, we start to see this decline in almanac sales after this. Um, so I, I find that story really funny. It's like, oops, you know, you, you made a good project, prediction, but good. it came back to yeah. bite you. <laughs> Yes, he's good thing he didn't predict an outbreak of, of theft and robbery. Or <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, I think we've got time for just one more question uh, from Tom Powell. Uh, thinking about Magdalen mathematicians advising the mayor of Oxford, uh, has predictive astronomy at times had royal or other government patronage? Mm -hmm. Fantastic question and a strong yes. Okay, less so in England, I would say, but still definitely here. But for the most part in places like Italy and, you know, uh, further north as well on the continent. So especially, this is the case, especially in the Renaissance. So princely courts and royal courts would almost always have a live-in state astronomer slash astrologer slash mathematician, because of course they're seen as kind of doing essentially the same thing. And they were treated as, you know, absolutely hu like hu of huge value to the state, right? Because if you believe in, you know, the things that astrology can do, you have someone who is simultaneously going to be able to predict what your economy is going to be like, predict if you're going to win a war, whether or not you should even bother sending your troops into battle, predict who you should engage with trade with, predict, of course, epidemics, but also you can do um, private kind of propaganda in favour of your monarch and mm. also against your, your leader, you know, or whatever, your princes or whatever, against their rivals, right? So you can say things like, and this, this is exactly what happens, you can say things like, okay, if we look at the nativity chart, so the birth chart of my leader, we can see that he's going to be an amazing ruler, right? <laughs> he has all these amazing qualities. God has clearly chosen him to be ruler. If we look at the chart of his rival, we see that he's actually probably likely to murder people. And actually, he's a really bad guy, right? And so astrologers are so, so useful. And, to ju and just to finish my answer to that question, um, the book that I showed you, um, Petra Sapianis's book, that was actually written to gain the patronage of the Holy Roman Emperor at the time, right? And that partly explains, you know, this lavish kind of binding and the title itself, you know, it has Caesar in the title, he's directing it to the emperor, right? Because he wants to get on the good side. And it, and it worked, right? He, he ended up getting, he ended up getting the job. Um, so yes, absolutely, hugely, hugely important for many, many years. Of course, it ended in the end. I, but although actually, no, one, la one last anecdote. Uh, <laughs> Um, uh, President Ronald Reagan had a live-in astrologer called Joan Quigley, who, uh, when I say wow. live-in, she was in the White House for decades, and she's actually written a book about her experience there. But wow. she, you know, she told the president, you know, when not only private things, when he should have surgery, but also, you know, when you should make this strategic announcement about this new, you know, bill that's going through, da, 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 right? So, I mean, it's still actually something that's around today. Um, absolutely. That is that is actually quite scary. Um, <laughs> la last um, point. This is not really a question, but it's a, a nice thought to end on. I think from Lawrence Target, who says there are said now to be more professional astrologers in Britain than ministers of religion. <laughs> <laughs> that's very interesting. You know what? I wouldn't be surprised. Yes. I wouldn't be surprised either. I'm, yeah. I'm not sure whether that's a, a good thing or a bad thing. I, I guess it depends on. Uh, where which which particular supernatural belief system you think is more or less helpful. Um, thank you so much, Michelle. Um, it's been an absolutely fascinating evening and um, there are more questions. I'm sorry, I couldn't um, deal with all of them because we had so many flooding in and uh, lots of people commenting how much they've enjoyed the evening. Oh, so great. thank you, thank you so much. And also for the beautiful slides that accompanied the talk, which were gorgeous to look at. Thank you very, very much. Thanks so much Thanks for having me. Thanks everyone for your questions. From Maudlin, uh, this is our last um, webinar of this academic year. We'll be back in the autumn. Uh, please enjoy the summer. Bye-bye.